Today I, I want to talk to you about a, a broad change that's happening in the industry, in the PC industry, in the consumer electronics industry, in the mobile device industry. How that relates to Linux, the role of Linux in that change. And then specifically I want to talk to you about where Moblin fits in to this change in the industry. And so to describe this today, I'm going to talk about three trends in the industry right now and how Linux is meeting those trends, and three challenges for the industry, three challenges for Linux, and how Moblin is allowing the people who participate in the Linux economy to meet those challenges. So Linux itself has come a long way in the last decade. In the last 10 years, Linux has grown from a small amount of market share in the server operating space to the fastest growing platform in every single category of computing. To, to see how far we've come, it's worth looking backwards in time at comments that people said about open source not too long ago. So, less than 10 years ago, about eight years ago, Microsoft said that open source posed a threat to anybody who used it. Microsoft said that the GPL and open source licenses were a threat to any organization who would use those licenses. Anybody who uses GPL code, who participates, who releases GPL code, would be in terrible danger. This was less than eight years ago. Let's look at where we're at today. This was just two months ago. Microsoft themselves are releasing open source code, contributing to the Linux kernel, and Microsoft, the, Linux's biggest competitor, is actually validating the fact that open source is really the future of software development. So how far has Linux come in that same period of time? Well, today, every single person in the modern world uses Linux multiple times every single day. And they might not even know it. When you do a Google search, you're using Linux. When you trade stock on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, you're using Linux. When you fly through German airspace, German air traffic control runs on Linux. When you use a cell phone, when you boot up a mobile device, when you use an ATM machine, when you record a movie on a DVR, when you watch a web-enabled television, when you see weather forecasts created by high-performance computing systems, all of those are based on Linux. And so why is that? Why is Linux growing so quickly in every single category of computing, from small embedded systems to large, high-performance supercomputing environments. Why? Well, it's because Linux is riding on three big trends in the industry that I'm going to talk to you about today. That first trend is the economy. And this is sort of counterintuitive because the economy right now is doing very bad. We're experiencing one of the biggest global recessions in any of our lifetimes. And in that global recession, Linux is actually growing faster than it ever has before. Market research firms are validating this, showing that as the recession has hit, more people are turning to Linux to save money, to create new products in a faster and cheaper way. You know, Economics recessions tend to accelerate pre-existing trends, and this is no exception. A trend towards Linux had been happening long before the recession hit, and now that there is a recession and people are focusing on value and things that matter, they're turning to Linux. Just a month ago, one of the largest market research firms in the computing industry reforecasted their market projections for Linux upwards. 
but for the first time they've reforecasted like this in, in many years because Linux is exceeding expectations in the marketplace even in this recession. So the economy, even though it's doing poorly, is great for Linux. The second trend that we're seeing out there that Linux is taking advantage of, that Linux is uniquely suited to meet, is the idea of convergence. I think most of you understand what convergence really means. Right? Convergence is the trend for functionality to come as features in a single device that were once standalone in separate devices. So today, a cell phone comes with a camera, with email, with a video recorder, with all sorts of functionality previously in standalone products. And so that's a good form of convergence. People really want that. People want to have all of this functionality in a single device. Now there sometimes are, are bad forms of convergence. There's sometimes cases where two good ideas come together and uh, it's not such a good idea in a single form. Th this is an example of bad convergence. You really, beer and hats, they don't go well together. So good convergence, bad convergence. But I, I just want, I think you all understand what convergence means. So how is convergence changing your industry? How is convergence changing our industry in the PC world? Well, I think it's worth going back in time again to understand how convergence is happening and how it will affect all of the activity that you're doing today, building uh, products and, and creating services. So if we look back at about the same time that Microsoft made that comment about the GPL in the early days of, of Linux, uh, I want to look at what I had for my PC back then. And this will give you an idea of how, how just how far the convergence has come. In about 2000, I had a ThinkPad T20. It was a pretty good computer for its time. It had a, a Pentium 3, a 650 megahertz Pentium 3, 3, pretty good processor, 12 gigs of hard drive space. It had a VGA monitor, modem, Ethernet. The battery wasn't very good. It was, it was actually pretty bad. Uh, and it was kind of expensive. It was over $1,000. At the same time that I had this PC, I had a, a cell phone, a Motorola a flip phone. I'm not sure that the Motorola flip phone ever made it to Japan, but it was very popular in the United States. And uh, I got this uh, phone back then for free. I got the phone for free from my wireless service provider in the United States, and I paid about 70 US dollars a month for 200 minutes of talk time and had caller ID. Coincidentally to the computer, the cell phone also had a terrible battery. It was really, it, it didn't last very long. Uh, but this was really uh, one of the better mobile phones in the U.S. at the time. So now let's, let's look today at the, the breakthrough devices that are in the marketplace. And I'm going to choose a non-Linux based device to make this example. Today I think people would agree that one of the biggest breakthrough devices in the mobile phone industry is the Apple iPhone. And if you look at this phone, it has a 600 megahertz processor, 32 gigs of storage, millions of colors in the, the, the video screen, it has voice, it has GPS, it has Wi-Fi, a camera. The battery is still bad, coincidentally. Somebody's got to figure this battery uh, problem out, but uh, it, it, the battery doesn't last all that long. Um, but if you look at that cell phone, that smartphone, it actually is better than that old PC. It has a faster processor, more storage, a better screen, better functionality. It really does almost everything that that old PC uh, used to do. Um, and it's significantly cheaper. It's only 300 US dollars. It's actually cheaper in the US if you get it from a wireless uh, uh, subscription provider. Uh, it's about 100 US dollars. Um, so the, the carriers subsidize the cost of the iPhone by two, three hundred dollars in the US. So that's all interesting. Phones are starting to look a lot more like PCs today, and I think that's the kind of convergence that we're talking about. But what's more interesting is the computer that I'm carrying, and that's an HP Mini 1000. 
Now, if you look at this computer, it has a great processor. It's actually an Atom processor, a 1.6 megahertz processor, 120 gigs of store, storage, Wi-Fi, voice over IP, Bluetooth, webcam, full software productivity suite, comes with open office, runs Linux. Uh, it has a, a decent battery. It lasts, the, the, it lasts pretty much the whole day for me. Um, and what's really interesting about this PC is that it's cheaper than the iPhone. It's cheaper to make, it's cheaper to buy, it's actually cheaper than a cell phone. And so when you look at these two new devices, what you're really seeing is the PC industry and the mobile phone industry, the mobility industry, coming together. Phones are looking like PCs, are looking like phones, are looking like PCs. People are now starting to be indistinguishable between the two. And in the old world, you really had a hardware-focused project product. You know, people bought PCs based on a nice keyboard or a good screen or a cell phone based on you know, the voice quality of the hardware or the form factor. You know, is it a very small phone? Does it have a little flip in it? Today, the world and these new converged products are really very software focused. The value for consumers in these new converged devices really comes from the software. And you really need good software. And so this is this idea of convergence. Two big industries, the mobility industry, the mobile phone industry, and the PC industry now converging into each other's markets, converging into each other's industries. And really redefining what a desktop means. And so what do we mean by desktop? In this new converged world, what do we mean? What do you have to have to be a good desktop? In the future, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, how are people going to access the internet? How are they going to share information? You know, to, in the PC industry, you did it through a desktop, and it was usually a Windows desktop. Right? That's how you communicated. That's how you got on the internet. But that's all changing. Is smartphone going to be the new desktop? Is this going to be the primary new way that people communicate, share email, text message each other, log on to Twitter, Facebook? Are MIDs and netbooks going to be the new desktop? Is that really going to be, is that a better way to communicate? Do people like a bigger screen? Do they want a bigger keyboard? Do they want a, a more full internet experience than they can get on, on the on a phone. Are mids and netbooks going to be the next desktop? Does, does any of this matter? Is it really just going to be the world of the browser? Right? Is, is that just going to be, are all applications going to be in a browser? Will, all, will the internet be the ultimate application and, and really a browser? That's all, all that matters. Is a TV going to be the new desktop? Are people going to want to log on to their favorite websites? share information, send photos, view those photos on their television sets? Is a car going to be the new desktop in this new converged world? Will people want to keep up with their social networks, share information, and access the internet increasingly through their cars? Well, the point of all of this, the reason I'm asking what the new desktop will be, is because nobody knows what the new desktop will be. The answer probably is all of these things are going to be the new desktop. The answer is there's probably some new device out there that none of us have thought of yet. Nobody has come up with the perfect form, the right balance of size and performance and you know, the perfect screen, the, the best way to you know, disseminate information. Is it a heads-up display in a car? Is it a holographic image somewhere? Uh, the point is, we really don't know what it's going to be. I do know one thing about what this new converged world will look like, what a new desktop will have. And that one thing is that all of these will likely use Linux. All of these new forms of communication 
all of these new desktops are likely going to be based on Linux. And what, what, why am I saying that? Why is Linux so perfectly suited for this new world? Why is Linux so well suited to create devices that nobody has ever thought of yet? Well, well let's explore why that is. So, there's a lot of technical reasons why Linux is perfect across a whole range of devices, right? There's a, a whole bunch of reasons from a branding perspective why it's great. But the first reason I always look for as to why a particular platform is going to succeed is look to the money. See, when convergence takes place here, when the PC industry and the phone, the cell phone and mobile industry start coming together, the way people make makes money changes. And so when I tell you that Linux is going to be a future platform across any of these type of, of devices, across any of these new desktops, let's look at the money first to understand why it's going to be Linux. And so let's look first again back in time at how the PC industry typically used to, and even now to some degree, make, makes money. This is what the PC industry economics in a very simple form looks like. On the right hand side, the lower right, you have an operating system. And today that, that operating system primarily is Microsoft Windows. In that world, Microsoft or an operating system vendor will sell their operating system, but the primary distribution channel for their operating system is to a device maker, an OEM. HP, Dell, Sony, Lenovo, Asus, Acer, they will purchase an OEM license. They will then bundle the cost of that license into their, the cost of their computer. And then they sell that computer to consumers on the left. And that's basically how you make money in the PC industry. Microsoft makes money in the operating system. The device maker makes money on the hardware. And they pass that software cost on through to the consumer. In this world, a tremendous amount of value for a consumer, for a PC user, comes from the ISV ecosystem, the applications that run on that particular device or computer. And then the economics of an ISV, an Adobe or someone like that, they really kind of get a free ride here. All the tools they need are free. They can freely sell their products on the Windows platform, or on the Apple platform, or on the Linux desktop platform. Right? And so they can sell their software to bundle it with the operating system. They can sell their software to device makers and bundle it with the actual device. Or in most cases, they sell their software directly to consumers who might go and purchase Photoshop or the internet, load it onto their PC, and use it. So those are the old economics of the PC industry. This is how money used to be made. The new economics that are coming, that all of you need to understand when you make new products, is that the PC industry is going to start looking a lot more like the mobile phone industry. The experience, the economics of, of the, the industry are really going to lean more towards that model than the old PC model. This represents a big change. So let me give you some examples of this. Let's use the iPhone as an example, since I used it before. In the world of the iPhone, Apple is both the device maker and the operating system platform provider. They no longer sell their phones directly to consumers. If you go onto the Apple website and you want to buy an iPhone, they will send you to, in the United States, AT&T or T-Mobile or a wireless carrier. They no longer directly sell the iPhone to consumers. So different from this previous model, you can see that there's a, an entirely new player in the economy here, the network operators. The new channel for these products are not the OEMs themselves or retail stores. It's through network providers who subsidize the cost of the device. So they pay Apple money to offer their products. 
and they essentially give away or greatly discount that device in exchange for a wireless subscription through a consumer. So the network operators are really making their money on the services and they're just giving away the hardware either at a very steep discount or essentially for, for free. So you have a totally new player in this marketplace. The other thing that's happening in here that's interesting is that application providers, ISVs, no longer get a free ride. If you want to sell an application on the iPhone as an ISV, you have to use Apple's SDK, you have to get approval from Apple to sell that application, and, and this is the important part, you give 30% of your revenue to Apple if you want to sell an application on an iTunes device. Totally different. To illustrate how big of a change this is for the industry, let's think of Adobe, huge ISV. Adobe makes hundreds of millions of dollars selling Photoshop and all sorts of Adobe products. What if tomorrow Adobe announced to their shareholders they were going to give 30% of their gross revenue to Microsoft just so they could offer Adobe products on the Windows platform? be a huge change. I mean, I think all of their shareholders would sell the stock immediately and go buy Microsoft stock, right? It, 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 but this is what has happened. This is literally what is happening in the industry. And that app store is going to be a permanent fixture of this new economy. It's, and it's not just Apple. Microsoft's going to have an app store. Carriers are going to have app stores. Everybody has an app store strategy out there. ISVs no longer get a free ride. You, you really see network operators now entering into uh, the distribution fold. And so this is a big change in the economy of the PC industry. So I wanted to explain that to you so you can understand why Linux is important in here. Why is Linux better in this economy for most of the actors than anything else? And the way I'm going to illustrate that is by showing you what a world looks like for a device maker if they use Microsoft Windows in this new economy. And, and I could give you a similar example for a network operator, but, but let's just use device makers for now to keep it simple. So these are the Microsoft economics for the device maker. They still purchase Windows from Microsoft. The big change for them is that they now sell their PCs or their devices to network operators in addition to consumers. And that's it. The device maker's business does not really change that much at all in the Microsoft world. Pretty much the same thing. It's a high volume, low margin, unbelievably competitive business really no change. Even though there's this big economic change, the device maker's role here, economically, using Windows as their platform doesn't change. Now let's look at if they choose to use Linux in this new economy. Their ability to make money greatly expands. Here's why. They don't have to pay a royalty for, to a software provider to use Linux. They can go find an operating system vendor, an OSV, to enter into a services engagement to offer, uh, to create a Linux-based device. They can call it anything they want. You can call it Sony operating system. You can call it Samsung operating system. You're no longer confined or dependent on a single third party in the case of Microsoft you no longer have to pay those royalties on a per device basis. Better yet, as a device maker, if you're creating your own operating system, you can also create your own application store. That gives you access to the very high margin software royalties on your own platform. So now, instead of giving Microsoft 30% of every application sold on your device, you, as a device maker, have the ability by using Linux to get that 
That is a tremendous difference in the new economy between using Microsoft or any closed or proprietary platform and using Linux. And so that is why Linux is going to be the dominant platform in this new converged marketplace of app stores and of mobile devices, of set-top boxes, of automotive IDI. Because the bottom line is that it creates more opportunity for more people. And that is what is really going to make a difference. That's how markets get made. And in this world, you're not creating a product. You're creating a marketplace. And that is what distinguishes a tier one company from a tier two company. Tier two companies create products. Tier one companies create markets. And that is what Linux enables in this new market. The final trend, also related to money, that's helping Linux in the marketplace is things are going to be cheap, and they're going to get cheaper. This is the new price of software and hardware. I'll make a prediction right now. In less than two years, the majority of people throughout the world will get a PC for free, just like they get a cell phone or a smartphone today. Because the cost of this hardware is going down, and the primary channel for delivering these is through a wireless provider who will subsidize those devices in exchange for services. This is the future of computing. This is already happening. In Europe, Today, this is from T-Mobile, but every single carrier has matched this in Europe. Uh, laptops are free. You basically go and get a wireless data plan with T-Mobile in London, and they will give you a laptop for free. And this isn't just happening in consumer PCs or smartphones or mobile handsets. This is actually, th th this idea of free hardware and free software is actually happening in the enterprise as well. In Silicon Valley, where I live today, the best new companies are creating websites, creating businesses where they don't buy any hard or any software. They don't buy any software. When, when, when a new company like a, a new Google, the next Google, creates their product, they use open source to create it. They don't buy a database, they don't buy an operating system, they use it open source to create their product. That's interesting, and they've been doing that for a while. What's more interesting is they don't buy any hardware either. New startups in Silicon Valley don't have a data center, they don't have a server, they don't have any hardware at all other than their desktop PCs, which they get for free, to create their new products. Instead, they host their service or their product on Amazon's cloud. If it's popular, they rent more virtual machines, it's not so popular, they rent less virtual machines, but the point is they have no hardware, no software, everything is a service, and that is the third trend, is we are moving towards a services economy. Money is going to be made offering streaming music, Google AdWords, streaming movies, sharing information, online advertising, these are all great examples of how the IT economy is really moving towards a services economy. Hardware is going to be free, the software is going to be free, all the money is going to be in services. So ask yourself, in a world where app stores, and streaming music, and streaming video, are where everyone's making the money, what are you going to do? What products are you going to create? What new ideas are you going to embrace to do that? And so Linux, in every one of these scenarios, is the perfect answer. And just to illustrate this final point on how Linux is perfectly suited for the new services economy, ask yourself one question. Could Google be the company they are today? if their entire product, if, the, if Google the search engine was built on .NET and Windows, or Solaris and Spark hardware, the company wouldn't exist. 
It's because of open source and because of Linux that these companies are able to succeed, to create the low cost infrastructure custom made for their particular service offering so that they can make money. Now, all of those trends are great for Linux, but there are challenges to meet these trends. And these challenges are really coming together right now. And the Moblin project really was created in many ways to meet these trends. And so I'm going to walk through some of the big challenges that the industry faces so that they can take advantage of these opportunities. And how Moblin itself as a project is really working to address these cha challenges. So the first challenge is that while Linux is perfectly suited for creating breakthrough devices that are custom branded, that have lots of flexibility to make money, Linux requires professional level service support to make it into a real product. You can't just download a generic version of Linux today, throw it on a laptop, and, and, and have that as a big competitive consumer device. You have to add some fit and finish, some industrial design to it. You have to bundle it with services. You have to add value on top of it. And this market is greatly underserved. This is going to be one of the fastest growing markets in PC industry, productizing Linux. Creating new breakthrough devices with Linux is going to be one of the breakthrough markets. And the reason for that is because Linux is really the baseline for a new industry that's emerging in semiconductors. So I talked the other day to a large consumer device OEM, and they said, you know, when, when we used to create a product, we really started from scratch. We'd get a board support package from a company like Intel. It came with a generic kernel, and we built everything ourselves. We created our own custom middleware. We created our own real-time operating system. Everything was created from scratch. Today, that's radically changed. Today, with Moblin, Intel is providing, using the Moblin project, Intel is providing a BSP that has a Linux kernel, middleware, a rich UI framework with 3D animation. I mean, it comes with this completely turnkey set of tools that you can then use as a device maker or someone who's creating a new product to quickly customize it, give it that fit and finish, turn it into something truly unique, focus really on a much higher level of differentiation than you ever have been able to do before because you didn't need to create all of that baseline technology infrastructure from scratch. So the bar is raising very, very hot in that world for competition. The other thing that's going on that's interesting here, the other big challenge is I talked to another large, this is a different company, another large consumer electronics company, and they're facing a huge challenge. The, this company, I talked to their management and they said, you know, when we create a, a, a product, traditionally in the last 10 years, we had lots of different products. We had cameras and television sets and set-top boxes and DVRs and uh, all sorts of consumer electronics, and each different product had a different operating system, a different set of software, and they were all created independently by different business units, and uh, that's how we created products. And the, this was a very senior manager at the company looked at me and said, it just isn't working anymore. It's too expensive. The, the bar for a software experience in these devices is too high. I really need to create a really rich experience across all these different devices, and I can't do it from scratch in every single device. I need to share as much code across these different products, across these different markets, as possible. And those are big challenges, productization, rationalizing, across a variety of product lines and market segments. Tough challenges. Well, this is what Moblin is really, really addressing. Moblin is allowing 
companies like the one I just described, to create products across a big range of markets, mids, netbooks, net tops, automotive, embedded, where they focus on usability, consumer experience, on high, high level innovation, and the operating system, the system infrastructure, all of that, they can reuse across all of these things. That's the power of the Moblin project. That is unique from a project perspective to Moblin. Even within other Linux efforts, which because I'm a Linux Foundation, I love all Linux efforts out there, but even other efforts to productize Linux and consumer electronics are usually focused in one market segment, just for phones, just for desktops, just for automotive. What Moblin does is from the start has a base layer of code that works across all of these things. That is of tremendous value as organizations try to compete at increasingly higher levels. Another big challenge for productization is creating new user experiences. Today, consumers want to have a 3D animation framework. When I turn on my new device, I want to enter my 10 social networking usernames and passwords. I want to enter my Flickr username and password, my Facebook username and password, my LinkedIn username and password, my Gmail password. And I want all of those web services to be aggregated into a single, rich 3D animation framework so that I immediately begin to use this device. I immediately have all my music. I immediately have all my photos. I immediately have all my contacts. That is the power that Moblin is providing by using the Mojito framework for web services aggregation to bring together in an aggregated fashion all of the rich social networking and media out there that you can get. By using Clutter, a really rich new UI framework to really provide a very differentiated user experience. And all of this can be customized, branded however you want, which is a pretty powerful thing. And it was designed that way from the start, and it is based on mainstream open source projects that people have already invested hundreds of man years in. The Linux kernel, x.org, GTK, all of these are different parts of Linux that have hundreds of man years of effort put into them. Hugely enthusiastic communities who are now, whether it's the GNOME guys or the kernel guys, all these enthusiastic communities are becoming enthusiastic about Moblin. So you've got this huge built-in developer community with this. This is pretty smart in terms of addressing some of these big challenges about bringing these products to market. So that brings me to a second challenge, and that's standardization. Standards are tough. You know, the great thing about Linux, one of the best things about Linux, I said it many times already today, is that anybody can call any kernel-derived operating system, any, anything based on Linux, you can call it anything. You can call it Linux. So the best thing about Linux is you can call anything based on Linux Linux. The worst thing about Linux is anybody can call any kernel-derived operating system Linux. It's a, it's a catch-22, right? What, what, what is Linux? It can end up looking like this over time, right? If anybody can call anything Linux, what is Linux? What, what does it mean, right? And so if you really want to take advantage of the network effects that Windows has, this huge ISV ecosystem, you need to create standards so that application developers can create an application and have it run across these different versions of Linux. And the Moblin project's doing that too. This is what it looks like. If everybody has a different version of Linux or a different version of mobile, and you get this fragmentation, right? ISVs are porting applications to all these different operating systems, and it's just too expensive to, to support those, right? 
But if you have standards and a compliance program across the different versions out there, you get a unified ecosystem, lower costs to ISVs, a bigger addressable market, you get great scalability, you get more code sharing across the operating system vendor community and OEMs. This is really what the future of computing needs, and this is really what the Moblin project is providing. The base of this is the Linux standard base. This is a project that the enterprise Linux world has been using for quite some time. Red Hat, Novell, Ubuntu, Debian, all of these enterprise versions of Linux on the server side use the Linux standard base to create this kind of unified ecosystem that I'm showing you on, on the, my left hand side. You can go see this today. In fact, the Moblin project is, is using this to create a Moblin compliance standard, a Moblin ISV standard. It's, uh, you can find it at uh, moblin.org slash compliance. And it's just a really simple infrastructure that takes a really long time to build. Uh, fortunately for all of us, we've already built most of it. But essentially what you get with the Linux standard base is two things. You get a distribution test kit. This is something that operating system vendors and OEMs can use to test their version of Moblin. And if they pass all of the tests, which test for every library version, every binary interface of those libraries, across an agreed upon set of components, if you pass those tests, then you can call your distribution or your version of Linux Moblin compliant. What that does is it allows ISVs, software vendors, to write Moblin compliant applications that will run on any Moblin compliant distributions. So in this case, an ISV would then go build a product on top of a Moblin operating system, download an application test kit manager from our compliance website, pass those tests, or use those tests to fine tune their application, and then they will be able to market their applications as Moblin compliant, and they will be able to be sure that those applications will run on any version of Moblin. These are online tools with immediate feedback. There's a build service that uh, basically facilitates application porting ease. This is a powerful set of tools that were built from the beginning for Moblin to solve this problem of standardization. We're going to be announcing more information about this program when it goes live. There's already, you can already see it in beta form today on our website. And we're pretty excited about the ability to create this type of ecosystem based on standards that allow different companies to compete and still be compatible. And what is going to happen is it's creating this huge ecosystem. And OSVs are going to be creating new products. You'll see them on the market over the next few months. And ISVs will start writing applications to the mobile platform. And sooner than you think, I assure you, because I work with all of these folks who are creating products or building applications, you're going to see a mobile ecosystem that has hundreds of applications, dozens of different devices in the marketplace, and we'll really start creating an, a, an economy, a market, that all of you can take advantage of to make a lot of money. And I think that is really what's going to make Linux successful in client computing for the first time. Every year I predict that Linux, the Linux desktop is going to happen this year. I predicted it last year, the year before, the year before that. Every year I predict the Linux desktop. Moblin truly provides the best opportunity for Linux to succeed in client computing. That combined with the natural trends I already described really make this a winner. Finally, a big challenge for Linux is legal issues. Because we share in the collaboration, because we share in the development of the software, we also share in the legal obligations and the legal defense of this platform. So I get asked a lot by people, is using open source more risky or less risky than using closed software? 
And the answer to that is open source software poses no greater risk than any other form of software out there. In fact, open source software has better legal safety mechanisms than any other form of software out there. Over the last 10 years, the Linux industry has learned how to meet all of the obligations of open source licenses and provide a huge set of very sophisticated resources for patent protection, for license compliance, for all the legal issues that you might need when you're creating an open source based device, all completely for free. And I would argue much better than any of the forms of legal protection that exist in proprietary software. The point is there is no greater risk. In fact, there's probably less. And this is best validated by the first two slides I showed today. If Microsoft is now publishing GPL v2 code, I think it's safe to say that there's no further question about legal safety when it comes to open source. So why Moblin? Why am I so excited about this project at the Linux Foundation? Well, it addresses the core challenges simultaneously. It's built for the web. It allows you to aggregate all those web services into a single rich experience. It's based on open source projects that have existed already. You already have a built-in development community of thousands of applications, or of, of thousands of developers. It's based on standards, so it can create the same network economy that so richly benefits Microsoft today. I think it'll create a bigger network economy because it's based on open standards rather than de facto monopoly. It works across a huge variety of phone fa form factors. You're, with Moblin, you're not trying to take a phone operating system and jam it into a PC. You're not taking a phone operating system and pushing it into a car. It's designed to work across automotive, PC, mid, phones, mobile devices. It, it, it's incredibly good for that. It has the integrated web services. It's easy to create app stores. Linux package management basically is an app store. For, for any of you that use desktop Linux, you know, add, remove application, it goes out to an application repository, the primary deliver, that, that which is essentially a free app store, the primary delivery system for applications in Linux already is an app store, so it's really easy to create app stores and take advantage of these new economies. It's backed by the largest names in the industry, companies like Intel, and many, many others. And it can be custom branded, and you have a lot more opportunity. So I'm pretty excited, excited about the prospects for Moblin in the future. So lastly, I'd like to encourage all of you to join the Linux community. Not because you're a good person, not because it's your hobby, but join the Linux community because it's in your business interest. In less than five years, by example, in the supercomputing industry five years ago, Linux had 10% market share. Everybody said, oh, Linux, you know, we don't think it's going to succeed. Linux now has 90% market share in just five years. I think the same thing's going to happen in mobile. It's already started. It's in your business interest to join this community. I'd like to encourage you to attend other events that the Linux Foundation is offering. <clears throat> Quick advertisement for my organization. We're going to have an event, uh, I think all of you have a flyer on your desk in Tokyo in October. Linus Torvalds is coming to Japan for the first time in over eight years. Uh, we're expecting hundreds of people at this event and uh, we look forward to having you there. We host a variety of other events, LinuxCon, our collaboration summit and so forth. We hope you can take advantage of those and attend. We'd love to have you participate in our projects. Moblin is one of our biggest and best projects right now, but we have dozens of projects that can help you in making printing better on Linux, in getting better driver support on Linux, and so forth. So we'd love to have you participate, and we'd love to have you join our organization. The Linux Foundation and its members represent 
billions of dollars in market capitalization. We are the largest open source project in the world. We are competing in every single category of computing harder and better than any of our competitors. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you very much.